Sadvite vachana vyakti pratibhati vadamite idang taditi vipashtam savadhana manasrinu. The teacher said, Your question is valid and very clearly expressed. I shall answer it exhaustively to make it as vivid as though you are seeing it nearby. Tattva masyadi vakyo tang yajiva paramatmano tadatmya vishayang jnanang tadidam mukti sadhanam Direct knowledge of the total identity between the individual self and the universal self, based on the great Vedic statements such as Thou art that, etc., is the immediate means of liberation. Kojiva kaparashchatma Tadat myang vakatang tayo, tatva masyadi vakyang va, katang tat pratipada yet. The disciple said, What is the individualized self? What, then, is the universal self? How can they be identical? And how do statements like, That thou art, Present and prove this identity. Atra bruma samadhanang kyo nyo jivas tamevahi yastvang prichasi manko hung brahmai vasi nasang shayaha. The teacher said, I shall answer your question. Who else can be the individual self, jiva, other than yourself? The one that asks me this question, who am I? There is no doubt about it. You are Brahman alone. Namaste. So, what is Vakya Vritti? Well, first of all, Vakya refers to the Mahavakyas, the great sayings of the four Vedas. And specifically, thou art that, which comes, of course, from Brihararanyakopanishad. And vritti means, in this context, a way of life, a practice, a style of living, what style of living? To attain enlightenment. And this is the first great question of the disciple. He asks, how can I attain self-realization, enlightenment? Please teach me the method. Not just the theory, uh, not just the philosophy, but the actual method of how to attain self-realization. You know, I love it when I get good questions. Questions like this, practical, down-to-earth, how-to questions of how do I do this, how do I do that, how do I attain enlightenment? I don't think anybody has ever asked me that question. And as much as it delights me when I get a good question, it and really evades me how I could go this, what, 12 years now on this channel without somebody asking me how to become enlightened. It's like, what? Duh? You know? Isn't that what this is all about? Isn't that the core issue? The main question from which all other questions derive? Seems like that to me. So now don't give me a, a bunch of imitative posts 
saying, how do I attain enlightenment? Because I know it's, it's not really coming from you, okay? It has to come in a natural way, a spontaneous way, out of an authentic need for liberation. So when the spiritual master in Vakya Vritti hears this, he replies, your question is valid and very clearly expressed. I shall answer it exhaustively to make it as vivid as though you are seeing it nearby. <laughs> Understatement of the week, huh? He replies exhaustively in 80-some shlokas. And oh, this is another characteristic of the relationship between authentic student and teacher. The teacher always gives more than the student asks for. Why? Because the student doesn't really know what they're asking. <laughs> they need additional context to make their question fully meaningful. If I don't know anything about cream cheese and I ask, what is cream cheese? You know, somebody has to start explaining to me all the different modes of milk and milk products, you know, which are quite complex and very interesting and absolutely necessary to understand cream cheese. But I, that's not what I asked, but that's what I needed to know. So in the same way, when a spiritual master gets a question like this, how do I attain enlightenment? He's not just going to give a step a, B, C, you know, he's going to explain the whole thing so that the disciple becomes independent. He has the knowledge. He can go off and practice it until he's ready. See, this was both the strength and the weakness of Zen. Zen used a method of teaching by creating circumstances, situations in which enlightenment could happen. That was its strength and also its weakness because it did that without educating the disciple how it's all working. So he couldn't go off and duplicate the process. See, this is why culturally Vedic culture is superior because it includes an educational process that gives the student everything they need to know to go off and do the process and duplicate the process independently without the guidance of the teacher. And so they can also pass it on to someone else and so on. The Zen students, even though they were enlightened, could not do that. I was in a similar situation back in 1984 when I got an amazing awakening a blessing, a Shakti pot from Shakti herself. And I knew that what happened to me was the real thing because that's the absolutely next thought that you have after cognizing Brahman or Nibbana or Nirvana, whatever you want to call it. The very next thought in the very next moment is this is it. This is the real thing. This is authentic. So when it happens to you, if you don't have the background, like at that time, I had a very meager background in non-dual philosophy and meditation. I didn't really understand what happened or how it happened. It took me more than 30 years of study to find gradually, step by step, uh, groping in the dark, <laughs> find the way to that knowledge. And of course, it's all through the mercy of my gurus. So then he says, direct knowledge of the total identity between the individual self and the universal self, based on the great Vedic statements such as thou art that, etc., is the immediate means of liberation. Then the disciple immediately replies, 
What is the individualized self? What, then, is the universal self? How can they be identical? And how do statements like, that thou art, present and prove this identity? Great question. Wonderful question. Why don't people ask me this kind of question? <laughs> I'm envious. <laughs> Why? Because it gives the teacher an opportunity to hold forth on the depths of his wisdom and the deep realizations that underlie authentic enlightenment and how it all works. And we've given a hint of this in our diagram of the four states of consciousness, their views, the yogas, and the chakras that are involved. But, you know, even though we try to propagate this as much as possible on the channel, when it's appropriate, you know, for the context, people don't ask deep questions about it. It's like, I don't know whether they just accept it on faith whether they really don't get it at all or, you know, some other alternative that I haven't thought of, seems to me they don't get it. That's because in the comments, people aren't using the correct Sanskrit names and so on. So it must be that they haven't duplicated the information. Well, you know, I would give my left little finger for a real student. <laughs> Somebody that would ask this kind of questions, because then, as the teacher says, I shall answer your question. Who else can be the individual self, Jiva, other than yourself? The one that asks me this question, who am I? There is no doubt about it. You are Brahman alone. Brahman manifests itself in the human form by the intelligence, the light from the heart that illuminates everything and creates understanding in the mind through the duplication of the meaning of terms. This is called language. But without that duplication, there can be no understanding. And this is the problem. Nobody knows the definitions of the terms. So if you don't know the definition, you don't know what the word means, do you? You have to understand this. You have to look up the definitions of the terms. And the next shlokas are going to highlight this. It's not something that I just made up. huh? Because, yeah, I was reading the dictionary when I was five years old, and I enjoyed it. Huh? But more than that, that led to a clarity of understanding that allowed me to duplicate and apply so much knowledge that I was offered scholarships in everything that I cared about and ultimately chose music because music seemed to me to have the most general applicability of any of the languages that I was being offered, including physics and math and so on. Music gives the general patterns of patterns. And everything else, of course, is based on that. Math, physics, geometry, you know, language, ontology, everything is based on that. So the relationships among everything are delineated by the words and the words, especially the small relationship words that matter the most for understanding, have many, many meanings, multi-ordinal, sometimes simultaneous meanings. The word up, for example, two letters up, huh, has 23 meanings in the Oxford on a Bridge Dictionary. Do you know them all? I know most of them. And I can certainly recite them when I see the word used in context in those definitions. You should be able to as well. And if you actually pursue this and go through our Becoming Genius series, you will gain so much 
ability to learn things and apply that knowledge and get the benefit. And in this case, of course, tattvamasi, thou art that Brahman. Aung tat sat, aung shakti aung, aung namah shivaya. <laughs>